Thank you so much, Christian. It's um, really terrific to be here. I'm sorry that my lecture won't be quite as exciting as Space Aliens, but um, I hope to tease you with some of our intergenerational findings at the end, which may be almost as outlandish as Space Aliens, so we will see. <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed the master class yesterday, and um, being at the home of um, Arne Ullman, really one of the founders of Fear Work, is really exciting for me to be able to come back and bring some of the work that I started with Mike Davis and have been continuing over the last um, decade or so as, as we focus both on molecular biology of fear learning and how the amygdala um, works and processes fear and how we can translate this to understanding fear in humans. So I will start with a classic diagram from Joe Ledoux and this is um, a picture to remind us of the, both the simplicity and the power of the amygdala and the fear system. What this reminds us of is that the amygdala is only one or two synaptic connections away from sensory systems. In this picture, we're seeing the visual system, but a lot of our work is based on the auditory system, where only a single synapse from the auditory from the ears, the cochlea, through the auditory thalamus to the amygdala. And at the end, I will talk about our work in olfaction, where smell is actually directly processed through the amygdala from the olfactory bulb. And many of you in the beautiful parks of Sweden may have been walking along and enjoying a nice, beautiful day on midsummer. And oh my god, there's a snake, and your heart is stopped, and you can barely catch your breath, and you're, not, you're frozen in fear. And then you realize it was just a stick. And when that happens, you find that the emotional system has taken off and has activated the endogenous, reflexive fight or flight system before you can be consciously aware of what's happening. And our patients, whether it's post-traumatic stress disorder or panic disorder or phobias, are experiencing this all of the time as their hypervigilant amygdala stress fear response is activated by memories. And in post-traumatic stress disorder, it happens by triggers that specifically remind the soldier of their memory, the New Yorker of the 9-11 victim, the car crash accident victim of the car crash. And post-traumatic stress disorder is associated with a number of symptoms, increased anxiety, memory alterations, problems with sleep, but most specifically, memory alterations related to the specific trigger, the flashbacks, and inability to inhibit those memories. And one of the reasons why post-traumatic stress disorder, I believe, is such an interesting and important disorder to study is that I think it is one of the lowest hanging fruit in psychiatry, because we're able to build on decades of work by people like Dr. Ullman and Joe Ledoux and Mike Davis and others on understanding the amygdala systems. But we also, for the only disorder in psychiatry where we know when it starts, it starts at the time of the trauma. And finally, PTSD builds on what we understand about learning and memory, which has been one of the other great successes in the neuroscience field over the last few decades. So I want to play a tape from a woman who had been traumatized and is talking about her memory to remind us how much PTSD is a disorder of memory. You can't get, you, you cannot get those horrible thoughts. It's just a repetitive wheel that keeps turning and it interferes with your, your everything. And you're, you're sitting there trying to feel happy or try to think yourself happy and just say, please take those thoughts out of my head. And you, you constantly are trying to distract yourself or set up little, you know, different props just to try to get those thoughts out of your head. So she can't get these thoughts out of her head. She's constantly haunted by these memories. That allows us with post-traumatic stress disorder to both understand what is it about these memories that are so indelible, and also to start to understand how these memories are interacting with the fear system of the amygdala and the other brain regions involved in fear processing. So how do we study fear in the, model, in the mouse or in the lab? And this is a classic way we do it. Um, I'm sure you've seen many times, the basic idea is we take a rodent, in our case we use mice so that we can use genetically modified mice, and we'll habituate them to a chamber so that nothing's novel about this particular context per se. We'll then play a tone, for example, and end that tone after 20 or 30 seconds with an unconditioned stimulus that in this case is a mild foot shock, about a half a milliampere, 0.6 milliampere foot shock. It feels like maybe a 9 volt battery on your tongue. It's sort of aversive but not particularly painful. After a few of those experiences, we often do five or 10, we can bring the animal back a day later, a week later, or a month later, and they will show profound fear. And we can measure that fear a number of ways, both with freezing and with enhanced startle. 
And again, decades of work by a number of people in the field, including people here, as well as people like Mike Davis and Joe Ledoux and Mike Fanslow and others, have worked out the neural circuitry of the amygdala such that it is now known that the, um, the, first of all, the amygdala, though we say the amygdala, it is made up of about 12 or 15 different subnuclei. We tend to focus on the lateral, basal, lateral, and central amygdala. The lateral is where auditory information comes in. Visual and olfactory information are primarily through the basal and medial. They're combined here with the unconditioned foot shock signaling information from the insula and other areas that mediate pain. And that is where this learning approach occurs, where the, the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus are paired at a synaptic level, and the synaptic plasticity events occur, so that with future exposure just to the sound by itself, the fear activation is occurring, such that the central amygdala activates the hypothalamic response, which we'll talk about in a bit, the, the um, cortisol and stress axis, as well as brainstem freezing, startle, and a number of other autonomic changes that occur with fear responding. If we come back to patients, I think one of the best ways to understand how the fear system is working in our patients is through the panic attack. And when someone experiences a panic attack, they'll say, all of a sudden I was dizzy, my legs gave out on me, I couldn't catch my breath. It felt like someone was choking me, my heart was beating too fast, I was terrified I was dying, I had to get away. And with these autonomic changes, breathing changes, gastrointestinal changes with panic, they're all a circumscribed and really stereotyped response. We typically associate the idea of a panic attack with panic disorder, but in fact, panic attacks can occur in a variety of anxiety or fear-related disorders, and we can really think of a panic attack as simply a fear attack. In fact, with panic disorder, it's called disorder because it seems to come from, come from out of the blue. It comes from nowhere. The disorder is the panic attack. But often, if you talk to your patients, the first time they've experienced a panic attack is after a period of high stress, depression, trauma, they had that first panic attack, but instead of associating the response of the panic to the environment or the experience, they associate it with the cues within their body, with their interoceptive cues, their sweating, their heart racing, they're not being able to catch the breath. So that the next time they experience this, they say, oh no, I'm going to have another panic attack, and it becomes fear of fear itself. With simple phobia, if you're afraid of spiders and a big spider lands on you, you have all of these symptoms. We just call it being scared to death but it's still a reflexive fear attack. And similarly with PTSD and acute stress disorder, the triggers that remind the patient of the trauma activate the fear response. All of these are associated with increased amygdala activation. So this is a bold image of an fMRI with a healthy human, or in our case, um, traumatized civilians, looking at fearful faces versus neutral faces, standard Ekman faces in which um, when you subtract these two, we see increased amygdala activity. This is very standard, done worldwide. But what is also seen worldwide, and this is a meta-analysis by Etkin, is that we see increased amygdala activation across a number of these disorders. And again, why the, I think this is so interesting is that decades of work have now shown that this amygdala activation, if we activate the central amygdala in a rodent electrically or chemically, or in human studies from patients <coughs> with epilepsy, for example, where they're doing stimulations to find the epileptic focus, we know that activation of the central amygdala leads to a hardwired reflexive activation through the lateral hypothalamus of heart rate and blood pressure changes, through the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus of corticosteroid stress release, the dorsal vagus of the GI distress, the parabrachial of the respiratory distress, and other brainstem areas lead to the monoaminergic, the arousal vigilance attention, the startle response, the freezing response. So that the hardwired fear reflex is what really underlies the panic attack, and I think is one of our lowest hanging fruits in psychiatry for understanding how does this work, and what's different about the patient who has fear in a way that they can normally control it, versus the one for whom fear is out of control, and they can't get the memories out of their head, and they cannot um, regulate their emotions. So then the principal question we see in the field is why do some people develop disorders, such as PTSD, and others recover after a trauma? And the first place we start is genetic differences. So we know from twin studies, from a number of studies, that about 30 to 40 percent of the risk for those who develop PTSD versus are resilient following a trauma is genetically heritable. And several of the stories I'll tell you today are examples of genes or gene by environment interactions that place one at increasing risk for PTSD following a trauma and beginning to understand how we think about that. <coughs> 
Another important point about genetics is we don't think anymore that there's going to be one gene for PTSD or for depression or anything else. In fact, half the genes in the genome are in the brain, and um, yet we only have a handful of different psychiatric disorders. We have hundreds and hundreds of medical disorders, so clearly one of the components is we don't yet know biologically how to split up psychiatric disorders in ways that make full biological sense. But almost certainly it's thought that there's going to be hundreds of genes that make up the risk for these different disorders. And I'll walk you through today several different ways in which we think about how we can break down this process of what's differential risk. So the first story I'll tell you is about FKBP5 as a modulator of cortisol and the, and the stress axis as it relates to differential sensitivity. Once someone then experiences the trauma for the first time, again, the instigating event with PTSD, they respond to it in different ways. What decades of work on learning and memory have taught us is that the memory does not become permanent immediately. Rather, it's consolidated over a period of minutes to hours to even days. And that consolidation process is by which the memory goes from being labile to being structurally permanent in the brain and represented in the synaptic connections in the brain. And we're starting to understand those molecular processes. What it also suggests then is if we could understand who is at risk versus who is not at risk following a trauma, whether it's in an emergency department after a civilian trauma or on the battlefield, one could potentially intervene by blocking that consolidation process and preventing PTSD from ever developing. And I'll tell you a couple different stories of gene pathways that seem to be involved in part in consolidation or differential risk for PTSD and how we can think about that process for maybe future interventions. Once the PTSD or, or the memory of trauma has developed, it is differentially expressed. Those who develop PTSD have nightmares, flashbacks, avoidance behavior, sympathetic startle responses. And they have several different cognitive components that we can differentially model and can understand to better understand what are the differences in these populations. For example, generalization. Someone will say who was attacked, perhaps, that I was attacked down this dark alley on this night by this person. And at first I was afraid of men, and then I was afraid of that part of town. Then I was afraid to go out at night, and then I didn't leave my house, and now I don't leave my bedroom. The world becomes more and more and more dangerous and less safe as they generalize the fear memory, and we're beginning to understand the processes involved in generalization. Those who recover discriminate. They say there are good people and bad people in safe places and dangerous places, but they can differentiate those two for cognitive reasons that we don't quite understand yet. Those who develop PTSD tend to sensitize. They say, Doc, every time I think about it, it gets worse. When I have a nightmare, it gets worse. When I talk about it, it gets worse. What's the difference between those, that process of sensitization versus the process that we call extinction that seems so critical to recovery? <clears throat> and Pavlov defined extinction as diminished response to cues over time. And in fact, we now think that extinction of fear is really the underlying component of how exposure-based psychotherapy works. You talk about the trauma in a way that you can both emotionally handle it, but in which is, is upsetting, and you talk about it, and you talk about it, and you talk about it in specific therapeutic ways. And through doing that, the memory tends to extinguish so that it's no longer emotionally overwhelming to you. And the last part I'll talk about today, then, is how we can enhance extinction by understanding the neural circuits of plasticity. And then at the very end is the teaser, whoops, I don't even have it on here, but I'll come back and talk a little bit about how we think differential sensitivity may be transmitted intergenerationally. We know that those at risk for PTSD, sorry, let me back up, those who have parents who have PTSD are at higher risk themselves for PTSD. And there's a number of pieces of data, things like um, the Dutch hunger winter, the Swedish famine, and others where there's evidence of metabolic and other types of intergenerational transmission through which um, we think we have some really exciting data in mouse olfactory fear learning contributing to this literature. So to start, I'll tell you about our population and how we're studying genetic risk in PTSD. So in Atlanta, um, <clears throat> we have a program called the Grady Trauma Project, which is the largest project that we're aware of studying civilian inner city trauma. It occurred to us a number of years ago, about a decade ago, that we had a very traumatized population, and I'm sure, unfortunately, you've probably heard about some of our inner cities in, Al in America, whether it's Atlanta or Chicago or Philadelphia or Detroit or LA. And in many of these places, we have high poverty rates, um, low um, health care rates, and lots of substance abuse and, and, and inner city violence. It turns out within this population, we have rates of post-traumatic stress disorder that are as high or higher that are in our, than in our veterans. <clears throat> 
And so we've begun to under, try to understand that from both an epidemiological perspective as well as from a biological and genetics perspective. We've interviewed close to 8,000 people so far and done genetic on about 4,000 of them and are working towards a full genome-wide association study on these 8,000. So we're not ready yet within this particular case, but what I want to tell you about is this broader program called the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium PTSD Working Group. So a number of years ago, within genetics <coughs> of psychiatry, it became increasingly aware that candidate gene studies are limited. And most of the data I'm going to show you today are candidate gene studies, and that's still most of the tools we have. But to really understand new gene pathways in a hypothesis-neutral fashion, we need to do large-scale genetics. Well, it turns out to do this, you need lots of people. Um, and there was a number, in, the, in about 2008, it was a question whether this was going to work or not. But since then, there's been tremendous success in both schizophrenia and autism. And this is an example from about a year ago in schizophrenia. And what these data, so this is from the Schizophrenia Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And this shows a minus log p scale. So three is p point equals 0 0.001, and eight is point 10 to the not minus 8, um, and that's a Bonferroni corrected P.05, 5 times 10 to the minus 7th or 8th. And basically what you say then is if you're looking at a million different polymorphisms across all 23 chromosomes in the X and Y chromosome, um, and then for each of those polymorphisms, what is the risk, the likelihood of that polymorphism, that gene variant being associated with schizophrenia? And once they got up to about 10,000 cases and about 50,000 or 30,000 controls, um, they started seeing a number of hits. Once they got to 25,000 cases and about 50,000 controls, they're now seeing about 60 hits. And when this number is even larger, they're now on the order of 100 or 120 hits. And so these are all different biological gene, you know, gene variants that point to biological pathways that are now well associated with schizophrenia. And both the schizophrenia approaches and the autism approaches are pointing out whole populations of, of synaptic proteins involved in the process of cortical function. So it's a real um, win for psychiatric genetics. And um, we um, have a group now um, of about 20 different investigators with, with large-scale PTSD um, data sets for which we hope over the next year to put together about 10,000 cases and about 50,000 controls in PTSD to really be able to start looking at the genomic architecture of PTSD. But again, we're not there yet. So I'm going to tell you where we are in terms of several different stories with genetics and the biology of PTSD. So the first one I'm going to start with is FKBP5. And what FKBP5 is, is it is a protein that regulates cortisol feedback. And cortisol um, is, the hypoth is, is the main readout of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal HPA axis that we so much associate with the stress response. And one of the critical things that has been shown to be dysregulated in PTSD is inappropriate cortisol feedback. So this is one of the more replicated findings in PTSD. This is one of the first data sets in 1983, but it's now been replicated many tens of times, and we've replicated it in our data set as well. And what we find is increased suppression of the HPA axis following dexamethasone, a cortisol analog. So if you take normal subjects, so this is everybody's baseline cortisol levels on, the, on day one morning. That night, they take low-dose dexamethasone, a cortisol analog, and then the next morning, you retest their cortisol levels, and everybody has lower levels. Everybody is suppressed to some level. But if you take the PTSD population, they may or may not have slightly lower, on average, cortisol, but what you see very profoundly is much greater suppression the next day. So this suggests that PTSD is a disorder that is marked by increased feedback of the cortisol um, feedback system on the HPA axis. So Elizabeth Bender, who's now the co-director of the Max Planck Institute and has been a friend and colleague of ours for years, started working with us looking at a number of polymorphisms in the gene pathways related to glucocorticoid regulation. And this is the basic story. Glucocorticoid receptors normally live in the cytoplasm. When cortisol binds, they dimerize, they translocate into the nucleus, and they activate gene expression, stress-related gene expression. Normally, though, one particular protein called FKBP5 acts as a um, chaperone that inhibits glucocorticoid receptor functioning. When enough cortisol binds, FKBP5 is dislocated and replaced with FKBP4, allowing GR to translocate and stress-related gene expression to work. However, one of the many genes that is activated by glucocorticoid receptors is, in fact, more FKBP5 
protein itself, thus serving to complete the negative feedback loop within the cell. So if we have a disorder that is marked by increased glucocorticoid receptor feedback, a particularly interesting pathway is a gene that's involved specifically in intracellular feedback within the cortisol system. So we began looking across a number of these genes, but this one in particular gave us a, a strong association with PTSD. But it wasn't a direct association with PTSD. It was an association with childhood trauma. So if we look at total environment effects on PTSD, we find that the total amount of trauma, and this is shown over and over again, is associated with increased PTSD risk. So this is the number of types of adult trauma with zero, one, two, three, four, or more, um, and PTSD symptoms on, with the PSS scale on the y-axis. If we look at child trauma, looking at no child abuse, one, one type of physical, sexual, or emotional child abuse, or two or more types of physical, sexual, or emotional child abuse, we also see people having much higher risk of PTSD, although often the PTSD, the index trauma that they report the PTSD about is actually an adult trauma, but their history of child abuse places them at increased sensitization, increased risk for PTSD following the adult trauma. And when we looked at that gene of the FKBP5 genotype with PTSD, we don't see anything by itself, and we don't see any interaction with adult trauma, but we see a very strong interaction with childhood trauma. And this is one of, of many examples of what it looks like. Um, and we have several different polymorphisms within this gene. And we find with this polymorphism is that one version of the genes associated with much higher rates of PTSD compared to the opposite version of this gene. This is an example from Amit um, Hariri's group at Duke that's showing that this risk polymorphism for, for PTSD is associated with higher amygdala activity. Um, Elizabeth's group gone on to show a number of other things. Torsten Klingel recently showed in Elizabeth's group that this risk allele is associated with differential methylation that then uh, interacts with stress, so that stress and glucocorticoid levels are interacting with DNA methylation, together altering how FKBP5 is expressed as a function of glucocorticoid receptors activation. And we're beginning to understand the, mechan the cellular mechanisms by which this gene is regulated by glucocorticoid receptors. For lack of time, I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but I'm going to show you a little bit more about how FKBP5 genotype is associated with brain function. So first, we know it's associated with increased amygdala activity. What about other parts of the brain? Well, one of the most, repli most replicated findings in PTSD is smaller hippocampal volumes. And this work um, was originally shown by Doug Renner when he was at Yale and um, he's now been in Emory for a number of years, but what the basic finding is, is using either MRI or CT scans, um, one finds smaller hippocampal volumes on average in patients with PTSD compared to normal controls. Now they also see this with some types of depression, and it seems to mostly be associated with the strongest effect sizes, again with childhood trauma across these studies. So Nagar Fani in our lab asked, does FKBP5 interact with hippocampal size as an intermediate phenotype? Because other data has suggested that hippocampal size is in part a function of glucocorticoid activation that can act in a way that's either thought to be toxic or at least associated with dendritic retraction within the hippocampus. And what Nagar showed was that the FKBP5 allele that was most associated with PTSD is associated with increased hippocampal activity to threatening faces, smaller hippocampal volumes, and decreased hippocampal um, functional connecti structural connectivity. So these are um, fractional and isotropy values using um, diffusion tensor imaging, DTI, in MRI, suggesting that the hippocampus cingulum tract is less intact as well in patients with the risk allele. So those data then suggest that, there's, that this one particular gene pathway is associated both in a genetic and an epigenetic way with the history of childhood trauma, that environmental component, that raises risk for smaller hippocampal volume, small, worse hippocampal functioning, increased amygdala activation, and increased PTSD risk. So again, we don't think in any way it's the whole story, but it's one way we can start to understand how a gene can interact with a history of trauma to alter the stress response system, raising the risk for PTSD. How do we identify new pathways? So I've talked about our long-term goal is to do these GWAS studies, but we're not well enough powered yet. Another way we can approach this problem is doing a convergent genomics approach. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data on two gene pathways that we've identified in which we've asked a question of 
are there genes that are associated with increased PTSD in humans, but are also associated with increased gene pathways associated with either fear conditioning or extinction of fear in mouse models. So we took, and this was several years ago now, we took our underpowered GWASP and we said, let's take all the genes that meet a nominal significance value um, with the PTSD versus no PTSD group. And then let's filter those genes by looking at pathways in mouse amygdala that are also either associated with fear conditioning or associated with extinction of fear with a hypothesis that some gene pathways associated with PTSD will also be associated with fear regulation. And the top gene pathway we identified was one called the um, adenylate cyclase activating peptide, um, or the PACAP receptor. And I hadn't heard about the PACAP receptor before and started looking into it, and it was quite interesting. First of all, <coughs> the first, um, the PACAP receptor had in 1995 been a, its, home, its Drosophila homologue had been associated as one of the first learning and memory gene pathways in Drosophila by Chip Quinn, who was at MIT. And I thought, well, that was very interesting. This is the learning and memory gene that we've now seen with human fear conditioning. But in fact, it was better than that. Once you read the paper, it's not obvious from the abstract, they actually identified these gene, this gene through a screening process that it was, was using Drosophila olfactory fear conditioning. They would take flies, fruit flies, and put them down two arms of a tube, and they would get odor A versus odor B, and they would get a shock on one odor, and then they would test them for avoidance of that odor. And they then screened for mutants that were associated with the inability to make that fear conditioning. So in many ways, we could argue that the PACAP pathway has now been associated with fear conditioning in flies, mice, rats, and humans. So what is this pathway? The PACAP protein binds, is a ligand that binds to the seven transmembrane PACAP receptor, um, which is also the ADCYAP. It's got, of course, like everything, has more than one name. Um, and the PACAP receptor activates the GS signaling pathway, which then activates cyclic AMP, PKA, CREB, and activates a whole host of transcription factor functioning, including BDNF and other neurotrophic factor effects. It seems to act both within the brain broadly, but also within the amygdala and the hypothalamus, but interestingly, in the periphery as a hormone that also directly acts on the adrenal gland, activating again more cortisol active release as well as noradrenaline um, directly with, and then directly acting on some of the distal targets. It had been associated to some extent with stress, but never with fear or with PTSD. We worked with Victor May at um, Vermont and found interestingly that PACAP peptide levels in the serum were associated with much higher rates of PTSD in females that were traumatized, but we didn't see any association with males. We looked across intrusive avoided and hyperarousal symptoms and similarly saw this female preponderance and we showed this in a replicate cohort. We then looked at the genetics of both the PACAP peptide and its receptor and we didn't see an effect with the peptide, but saw again a very interesting sex specific effect with um, the receptor. So this is the gene encoding the receptor, and these are different polymorphisms spanning the receptor. So we did a tag SNP approach looking at about 30 different polymorphisms across the entire receptor. And we asked, are any of these associated with increased risk for PTSD? And we did not see an association in males in red, but we did see an association with females in blue at this one particular polymorphism. And what was interesting about that polymorphism is it lies right in the middle of an estrogen response element in one of the introns. And we're now doing work to show that looks, um, it looks like in vitro and possibly in vivo, this particular C to G alters estrogen response affinity for the site and thus may alter the estrogen ability to activate gene expression within this receptor. And again, this polymorphism in this ERE, estrogen response element, was associated in females with increased PTSD symptoms compared to the opposite allele. And we were able to look at a publicly available human database where they had both mRNA from court, human brain cortex and um, a full genome-wide association data and pull up a poly this polymorphism and show that this polymorphism that was associated with increased risk was associated with differential mRNA in women, but again, not in men, in a normal cohort suggesting that this polymorphism was associated with functional differences in expression of the RNA in women, but not men. 
<coughs> replication cohorts have now been um, looked at in our lab, and, and two different groups in separate cohorts have shown an association with PTSD in this polymorphism. And as we've added more samples, so now about 1,500 females, we see not just a main effect, but we really see a gene by environment effect again. So this is looking at total trauma load in women versus men. And in men, we don't see much. But in women, we see this strong effect with, um, as, as the amount of trauma exposure gets higher, we see this separation with one version of the gene giving much higher risks of PTSD than the opposite version of the gene. What is, is it associated with brain function? Again, so we can look at the two different alleles of this, this PACAP receptor version and again see higher amygdala activation to, heart, to fearful faces and decreased amygdala hippocampal connectivity, functional connectivity in the high risk group. And again, if we come back to what we're thinking the hippocampus does is it's acting in some way to either enhance extinction or dampen amygdala activity in a way opposite of the amygdala activation with fear so that either smaller hippocampal volume, as we suggested with FKBP5, or decreased hippocampal amygdala activity can both be associated with function associated with increased um, stress and PTSD risk. What about physiology? So this is Angelo Brown, who is um, our research coordinator at Grady and our best model. And Angelo is showing for us um, how we do physiology in humans. And so this is um, where we, he wears an electro, EEG, basically electrode, under his eye and is measuring orbicularis activity of the eye muscle. And he's receiving startle bursts through the earphones. And when he hears a startle burst, um, he will blink automatically, but if it's in the presence of a conditioned stimulus that's been associated with an unconditioned stimulus, and in this case we're not using shock, we're using an air blast to the throat right here as our sort of unconditioned stimulus to the throat. So when he sees certain shapes, he'll get the air blast to the throat and other shapes he want. And when we see the shapes associated with the aversive stimulus, you see more startle compared to the others. So that's the way in humans we can measure startle very similarly to how we can measure startle and fear in mice. And what we find is that, first of all, it's been shown, we've shown in others, that PTSD is associated with more startle in the dark than the light. And so humans are normally slightly more um, anxious in the dark, and it's a very dark in, um, box. Um, but females with the risk allele have much higher startle in the dark compared to um, those with the opposite allele, whereas males don't show a difference in this particular paradigm. And this is independent of PTSD status. Additionally, we show, independent of PTSD status, that males looking at the peptide levels, the PACAP levels, don't show any difference to the danger cue or the safety cue, whereas females with high levels of the PACAP peptide have much higher um, startle, both to the danger cue and the safety cue, again suggesting that they're showing more fear response in general, and they're not discriminating. They're generalizing this fear, as we talked about earlier, showing more physiological fear response to the safety. And again, both of these phenotypes we're seeing in not, not in just in the PTSD group, but across everybody as a function of genotype and sex. If we look in kids, so this is a highly traumatized um, population and their kids. So the kids have had some level of trauma. They don't have PTSD, but they have moms who often have PTSD, and they're a very high-risk population. If we look... Um, in the kids, we're seeing increased startle, again, with the risk allele compared to the resilience allele. But in these prepubertal um, age group, we're not seeing a male-female effect. And so one of our current hypotheses that we're working on is following these kids longitudinally and both trying to understand their risk and, again, try to understand ways in which we can um, intervene and decrease both their risk and the intergenerational risk, but also ask, does the sex um, and genotype interaction separate through puberty. Do we see now, will we see a female effect post puberty, but no longer see a male effect? So, this and other s studies that we've done, where we've also shown again that the PACAP genotype is differentially estrogen sensitive, and in mice and rats, that PACAP expression is stress and fear conditioning sensitive lead us to a model where estrogens interacting with differential genotypes within the PACAP receptor, leading to different PACAP, PACAP receptor activity and sensitivity that then differentially alters a number of stress response genes through the CREB system, altering stress and cellular plasticity. 
And I forgot to mention, but PTSD, as a number of anxiety disorders, has about a two to one female to male preponderance. And so we think this is one way that we can start to think about how sex is interacting with stress responsiveness to give a mechanism for differential sensitivity. Again, so this PACAP system is one in which we did not a priori know about, no one knew about, was it might be associated with PTSD, but we found by taking this hypothesis neutral convergent genomic approach, looking at genes associated both with PTSD and mouse amygdala function. There's another gene I want to tell you briefly about that um, we're excited about that came from this same screen called, called the tachykinin 2 receptor. And what we found from the similar screen was that one, that this particular gene called tachykinin 2, which is also called neurokinin and activates the neurokinin B receptor, after fear conditioning, increases greatly in the amygdala and then slowly decreases back down to normal after about two hours. And in a separate experiment, um, and this is all work by Raul Andero, uh, um, a postdoc of mine from Barcelona who, who, who's outstanding. And what Raul showed was both this increase in TAC2 expression as well as following um, pairing um, of, of uh, shocks and tones only an increase in the TAC2 gene expression in the paired group but not the unpaired group consistent with an associative learning process, um, not an unconditioned process. And what's really interesting about TAC2 is it's expressed very specifically in the central medial component of the amygdala. So what a number of groups, including Andreas Luthi, um, or primarily Andreas Luthi's group in um, Basel, Switzerland, have shown, is that there are multiple different subnuclei with, or cell populations within the, within the amygdala. So I talked about the central amygdala, but it can really be broken up into the central lateral and central medial divisions. And there's two sets of cells in the central lateral. One is the PKC delta cells, which are thought to be inhibitory, and another one's the CRF cells, which are excitatory. But no, and then they both project to the central medial neurons, which are the real output neurons activating the whole fight or flight system. And nobody knows about any particular cell populations within the central medial system. And it seems like these TAC2 neurons may be um, among the first neuron identical, identified populations specifically expressed in the central medial nuclei. And um, so one thing we know so far then is that, there, that its expression is regulated by fear. It's expressed in the main fear output nucleus and um, it was identified in this convergent approach in, in humans and mice. So another advantage of the TAC2 receptor is it has a drug that's been able to target it um, that's been known about for a while called asanitant. And for a while, neurokinin B was being entertained as a hypothesis in schizophrenia. Um, I don't think much as a lot has come of it, but as part of that, pharmaceutical companies made this drug asanitant, which blocks this receptor. So Raul gave this drug, so, we, so first he associated with differential expression of the gene with fear. And so now we're going to ask, if we block the receptor, can we block fear learning? So he gave the drug either before fear conditioning, the, sh the tone shock pairings, or during the consolidation period right after fear conditioning, at 10 minutes, 1 hour, 4 hours, or 24 hours after fear conditioning. And then he tested the animals 24 hours later. And at 24 hours on test, um, we're looking at the vehicle response versus the sanitant response. If he gave the drug four hours after fear conditioning, there was no difference at all. So that suggests that the drug by itself, given 24 hours, doesn't affect fear conditioning. And by four hours, there's no sensitivity anymore. But if he gave it either before fear conditioning or up to one hour after fear conditioning, he saw a significant reduction in the fear consolidation process. So then so far, this suggests that it's a gene that's expressed with fear conditioning, it's expressed in the output nucleus of the amygdala, and it's involved in fear consolidation. He then went, and that was all systemic. He went on to show if he gave it specifically within the amygdala, he could decrease fear conditioning. And then he made a virus that overexpressed the gene. So instead of blocking the pathway with the, with the drug, he's now overexpressing the TAC2 specifically in the central amygdala. And when he does that, he compares virus, animals that are infected with a virus with an with a inert fluorescent protein versus the TAC2 gene. He finds no difference in fear acquisition, but when tested the day later, shows much higher fear in those that express the TAC2, suggesting increased consolidation of the fear memory. And then finally, shows that this increased consolidation of the fear memory in these virus-infected animals can be normalized if we can block the receptor with the osanitant drug blocking the um, pathway. Finally, he shows that if he blocks the um, PACAP receptor pathway, he can then um, 
he can decrease the PACAP receptor in mRNA that's ex increased with, um, with fear consolidation. So again, I showed you earlier that if we fear condition animals, we get more PACAP RNA like I showed you a moment ago. If you use the osanitant drug to block the upstream TAC2 pathway, that prevents that increase, suggesting these two may be tied together. So the take home message from this part of the talk is that TAC2 is a gene that's expressed specifically in the central medial nucleus. We found its expression after fear conditioning and show that if we b either block its receptor with the drug or overexpress the TAC2, we can um, modulate fear in a predicted direction. And it suggests that this osanitant drug may be a particularly interesting target to use um, during the consolidation period after fear conditioning to prevent the development of fear and in humans to prevent PTSD by blocking people at risk for PTSD in an emergency department or in a battlefield setting. Obviously, there's a lot that has to be done there, but the, the advantage of a sanitant is it's already been used in a number of human trials and already has a lot of safety data, so it may be relatively easy to translate into human studies quickly. So along the idea of translating um, already available drugs to human studies, I want to tell you briefly about enhancing extinction of fear with decycloserine, a drug that's already commercial or <coughs> generically available for the treatment of tuberculosis. So I'm going to focus on the NMDA receptor, which is a glutamate receptor involved in synaptic plasticity and learning and memory. Cycloserine is a drug that activates at the serine site in the serine glycine modulatory system of the NMDA receptor that's involved in synaptic plasticity. It is also, the cyclic moiety of serine had been used for, as a, for tuberculosis treatment because it mucks up bacterial pr um, protein synthesis at the serine site, um, and it had been used for, since the 1960s. It was found in the 1980s to act on the NMD8 receptor and to increase learning and memory function. Mike Davis's group, who'd been mentioned earlier, um, had, shown in in <clears throat> had shown in 1992 that extinction of fear required NMD8 receptor activity. This is what they did. They would take rats that were afraid, so they would train them to be afraid of a light, and the red bars show how afraid they were. They would then take um, those animals and give them 60 lights in the absence of any shock, the extinction process, and test them the next day. And now they're not afraid anymore. So that's the extinction curve. If you then do that, if you do the same experiment, but in the presence of AP5, a drug that blocks the NMD8 receptor, and test them again off of drug, they're just as afraid as they ever were. So this suggests that learning to inhibit fear is an active process that requires new synaptic plasticity and requires NMD8 receptor function. We then reason, could we enhance this process and make it work better by enhancing NMDA receptor function by using the cyclic cycloserine drug? And what we showed is that we could do, instead of 60 lights, which would give us a four effect, we used only 30 lights. So they would partially extinguish, but still have some level of fear remaining. If we did that with decycloserine on board and then tested them off of drug, they now had less fear than they did with saline, suggesting they extinguished more readily. This basic process was replicated in a number of studies in rats and mice with Rick Richardson's group doing some of the most work showing its role in the consolidation process of extinction learning. Again, what was exciting for us about this drug was it was already shown to be safe in humans, so we could quickly work with Barbara Rothbaum to try it in a human trial. And what Barbara had shown was that virtual reality for fear of heights was a really nice way of studying fear exposure or fear extinction in a laboratory setting. People would go up up to 19 floors on this virtual glass elevator wearing this virtual helmet. They would walk out on these virtual catwalks, hold on to the bar, and look down at the virtual lobby below. Now, this was made in the 1990s, and the, the graphics are quite simple. My kids are not impressed. Um, <laughs> but if you're afraid of heights, you only have to go up a few floors before you start sweating, your heart starts racing, you start getting nervous, and people can't handle it. If they go up too fast, they have to take the helmet off. So what they would, had shown was after six or eight sessions, people who were normally deathly afraid of heights would get a lot better, and they could go over bridges, they could go up elevators. What's nice about this as an approach to studying um, extinction in humans is everybody gets the same exposure, the same test before, the same test afterwards, and you can control it in a much easier way than with talk therapy. So this whole study then, normally it takes about eight sessions. We did the whole study with two sessions and two pills. Everybody either got placebo or decycloserine, and um, 
within that one month and three months later, we were able to show that those who'd received the decycloserin in a placebo-controlled, double-blind fashion made much greater gains and had significantly less fear on a 100-point SUD scale than did those with placebo. They looked like they got as much better as they would have had they had six or eight sessions. They were twice as likely to go up bridges, to go over elevators, and um, they had decreased galvanic skin response in the session. So this was the first study in 2004. And since then, there's been a number of studies suggesting <coughs> that decycloserin can enhance exposure-based psychotherapy in a group setting and individuals um, with post-traumatic stress disorder, Agnes van Miniman, um, showed that in people with low-level symptoms, there was no difference, but with high-level symptoms, she saw a nice difference. With panic disorder, um, Dave Tolan, who has been here recently, showed a nice difference with Mikado. And in obsessive-compulsive disorder, both Edna Foa and Sabine Wilhelm had been able to show in a difference um, in adults with faster rate of responses. There's been a couple of negative studies. Um, in both kids and adults across a number of these studies, and we're still trying to figure out what's the difference in the studies that have worked and those that have not worked. But overall, there's been quite a number of exciting positive results. And Christian's um, work here, Christian Rook's group here, is doing a very exciting study with a large number of several hundred um, subjects with um, inter internet-based OCD treatments across Sweden with decycloserin. So we can't wait to find out how that works. And this, um, the data so far have survived a couple meta-analyses. Um, and we're, the last study I'm involved with related to this is with Barbara Rothbaum, where she's, um, they're wrapping up a double-blind placebo-controlled study of Iraq and Afghanistan vets using two different um, virtual environments, um, one of which is a virtual Baghdad on the street, like shown here, and another one is a virtual Humvee. And the therapist will work with the patients to identify what their primary triggers were and then work with them through about five sessions of the virtual reality exposure in, again, a double-blind placebo-controlled fashion using either decycloserin placebo or an active comparator alprazolam. So hopefully, um, within the, by the spring, we'll know how this study has turned out. So I've walked you through a number of processes by which we can understand the um, differential processes from the hippocampus, amygdala. I haven't talked about the medial prefrontal cortex today, but again, all of the amygdala structures I've talked about lie within really a circuit that's regulating fear functioning and fear regulation, and also by understanding the different neuronal subpopulations, including the medial population, we can understand how fear extinction is occurring, one part of which is via plasticity at the NMDA receptor uh, that we've been able to show is enhanced by decycloserine. But again, what we hope is really moving forward is a new pharmacotherapy that can be done in a rational way, targeting a number of different cell processes, both at the learning and memory synaptic plasticity level, as well as through specific neurokinin, tachykinin, et cetera, pathways that together can be convergent in a rational way on regulating the fear output process, either by dampening fear or enhancing extinction of fear to inhibit fear memories. And in maybe my last five minutes, what then I will tell you about is something entirely different. <laughs> but um, I thought I'd go ahead and show, because it's um, been in the news a lot the last couple of days, because it just came out. And it's, we, we think, a quite exciting new way of thinking about intergenerational risk as well. So <clears throat> there's evidence across a number of studies that in addition to genetic differences for who is at risk versus who's resilient for PTSD, that if you have a parent with PTSD, you're at higher risk yourself. There's evidence with Holocaust studies that, um, gener that grandchildren from Holocaust survivors are at higher risk. And there's bits and pieces of evidence in, in mouse literature that risk can be transferred. But there's not really a good system for understanding how this may work. In humans, within our own data set, we have data that moms with a history of abuse, high abuse versus low abuse, that their, their child's off <laughs> their offsprings fear potentiated startle that I showed you earlier is increased in the moms with, with a history of high abuse, even if the kids haven't had any trauma themselves. So again, in a non-traumatized child population, their physiological response is correlated with mom's history of trauma. What we would ideally need is a mechanism by which we could study across intergenerations. We could study in a mechanistic way with a tractable system and have molecular level identification. And I'm just going to show you a couple pieces of data from Brian's recent paper that 
Christian showed on transgenerational transmission of olfactory fear. And this started in work we did about five years ago with Seth Jones in our lab, where we showed <clears throat> that we can structurally change the olfactory representation of an odor if that animal has been trained to associate fear with the odor. So what you're looking at here is olfactory bulbs, the part of the brain that encodes the olfactory information. The blue tiny fibers here are axons coming from the nose representing a single odor receptor gene, um, in this case the M71 gene, that converge on a glomerulus rep where the information for that odor is stored and activated. This particular pathway, we know we can activate with a, a, a one kind of odor called acetophenone, or we can use other odors that don't activate this, and we can then specifically say, how does one odor versus another odor affect this pathway? And what we found is in adults, if we train them to be afraid of acetophenone, they increase the number of neurons in the nose and have a much larger glomeruli and thicker axonal projections into the glomerulus in the olfactory bulb. So in an adult, you can get structural changes associated with odor fear learning. What Brian Diaz in the lab has gone on to show is that this basic process appears to be transmitted intergenerationally. So he took mice, he trained the fathers to be afraid of odor A versus B, in this case the odor that activates this particular pathway versus a different odor. Behaviorally, the animals look the same. Then he um, mated those animals 10 days after training. He then removed them from the mother. The mother raised the pups, and we looked at the pups when they were adults. They were totally naive, and the mom was totally naive to the odor exposure. When we looked at the same structural pathway, the offspring that had had fathers that were trained to acetophenone have much now denser neural projections and larger glomeruli than the offspring that were, had the same fear conditioning but to a different odor, propanol, or those who had fathers that were just home caged. It looked like the father's history of olfactory fear conditioning has now altered the offspring structural representation of this odor. And we can quantify that here. And he can also then show that behaviorally, these animals show an enhanced olfactory sensitivity or enhanced olfactory startle to the acetophenone than they do the propanol. <clears throat> if we look at the second generation, the F2 generation, um, so this just also shows that in addition to the bulbs, we see more neurons in the nose. If we look at the, so we can then take that F1 offspring generation, let them grow up, have kids, um, again, they're naive their entire generation, and look at the second generation, and the second generation is now also showing increased glomerular size if their grandfather was trained to acetophenone compared to if their grandfather was trained to a different odor of propanol. If we look behaviorally, we can show that if their grandfather was trained to acetophenone, they show a larger olfactory potentiated startle, OPS, to acetophenone than if their grandfather was trained to propanol. Although we don't have a structural representation of propanol, we can show the double dissociation behaviorally because if their grandfather was trained to propanol, they now startle more to propanol than to acetophenone. He also showed, I won't show it here, but that if we train the mothers, we can see a similar effect and that that survives cross-fostering. So if we train the mothers, look at the offspring, we see an increased glomerular size. If we cross-foster them at the first day of birth, the size of the glomerulus and the behavior goes with the biological mother, not the cross-foster mother. And then finally, I think the nail in the coffin is we trained fathers, we took their sperm 10 days later when we would have, na when we would have um, mated them. And we looked at the, we then transferred the sperm to our, in our transgenic facility that has no odors, they're totally naive, and again, those animals, when they're raised, now have larger glomeruli, like the ones in our lab. And finally, he took the sperm um, of, the of, the, of the fathers and showed that if we look at two different odorant receptor genes in the genome of the sperm, and we look at an odor receptor that is sensitive, the M71 that's, that's sensitive, it's called OLF-151 is another name for it, that's sensitive to the um, acetophenone versus a different odor receptor. There are no um, methylation differences in the trained groups with a different odor receptor, but in the receptor sensitive to acetophenone, those fathers trained to acetophenone now show decreased methylation in this odorant receptor that uh, holds up across several different sites. And if we look at the F1 generation, there's still a maintenance of this decreased methylation.
suggesting that somehow the olfactory information when the father is getting trained is being transmitted at the level of the sperm such that the, the receptor associated with that odor is demethylated, which we know is associated with increased expression, and then in the subsequent generation, we see increased expression of that receptor and increased sensitivity of that receptor, suggesting that across behavior, neuroanatomy, and epigenetics, we have, can begin to study this process by which um, a fear-associated process may be, at some level, intergenerationally transmitted. I think these findings raise more questions than they answer, but they're really exciting for us in terms of some next ways to go in beginning to understand this process. So in summary, we've <coughs> walked through how we can understand the process of fear, both within the brain, but within the gene pathways that regulate brain sensitivity that lead to differential sensitivity within the primary generation and now beginning to look across generations, as well as how these gene pathways alter fear regulation and fear sensitivity, and then how they may be associated with recovery so that we can together start to understand in a rational way new ways of intervening in treatment. The work I've shown you has been done by many people, genetically mostly, and humans have been collaboration with Elizabeth Bender, and um, Raul Landero did the TAC2 work, and Brian Diaz the intergenerational work. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.